Hello, everyone out there in video land. Um, Stephen Kinzer and I are here. I'm Richard Boucher of the Watson Institute. And uh, we were going to talk about America's role in the world and whether uh, the United States is a power for good or if we've just screwed up too many things. So uh, we thought we'd start out with a little bit of history and then go to what's what's situation now and what comes next. Yeah, I think it'll be a fascinating uh, little journey. Let's let's try to take American foreign policy through the uh, decades since the end of the Second World War, and particularly since the end of the Cold War, and try to come up with some conclusions about uh, how dumb or how wise or how evil we actually are. Go ahead. Uh, why don't we start in the period after the Second World War, uh, particularly during the 1950s? The Eisenhower period was, of course, the height of the Cold War. How do you see the United States role in the world then as having been beneficial and positive? Well, I think we were the major positive force. I mean, let's remember the 1940s, we had to sort of solidify what we called the free world. We had to prevent uh, communist takeovers and communist insurgencies in Greece and Turkey and other places. Uh, we solidified free market economies and democracies in Western Europe when we started building the institutions. Even the European Union was a product of the Marshall Plan that the United States used to strengthen and solidify Europe. So uh, by the 1950s, we were building NATO, we were defending the free world, and, and really solidifying democracy in the places that have been ravaged by war and preventing the countries, in this case, Germany and France, who'd been fighting each other in Europe for a long time, from ever going to war again. Well, that was well spoken by somebody that was a State Department spokesman, and I should let our uh, viewers know no that we have somewhat different perspectives. So Richard and I have something in common, which is that we are not professional academics. But although Richard has spent his time in the diplomatic corps and risen to quite high positions in the State Department, I was working as a New York Times foreign correspondent. So we both have views of the world that are different from those that come from the academy, but they're also different from each other. So let me comment a little bit about the period after the Second World War and into the 1950s. I think you're right that the United States did play a role in stabilizing Europe, although we wanted to stabilize it in a particular way so that it would be open for American influence, particularly economic influence. But I also think it was in this period that the United States made one of its greatest conceptual mistakes. We looked around the world in the early 50s and decided that the whole world was defined by a split. And the split was on one side, the countries that were loyal to Moscow and the others, the countries that were loyal to Washington. So it was communism versus what we called the free world. But actually the real division in the world, which we didn't see was different. It was between the developed countries, the countries that had been imperialists and had exploited the world for generations, including the Russia, the United States, France, Germany, Britain, against all the rising forces of nationalism in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. We completely failed to understand the power of nationalism and in our blindness of thinking that only the threat of communism should occupy our attention we failed to recognize what was really the most powerful force in the world at that time, which was the nationalism emerging from newly decolonized countries. Failing to recognize the vibrancy of that trend and that power in the world, we took it as a manifestation of communist influence and start, tried to crush it. And that placed us in opposition to many of the rising forces that were going to shape the second half of the 20th century. But there was massive and active involvement by communists in Moscow in, I mean, going back to the 40s with the Chinese Revolution and going into the 50s and the 60s. By the time you get to the 60s and we start getting involved in Vietnam, which I admit was a huge mistake, uh, but it, it, was, it was hard to separate nationalism from communism. The people that professed the anti-colonial uh, uh, rhetoric uh, in, the, in North Vietnam were, were dedicated communists. They had active support for Moscow. Um, and yeah, they may have been nationalists and they may have expanded because of their nationalism, but they were also, uh, you know, communist insurgents, you might say. And what about the American involvement in overthrowing the government of 
Iran in 1953 and the government of Guatemala in 1954. Those were episodes where we thought we were fighting communism, but actually we were just fighting domestic nationalism. Uh, yeah, that's true. I'm not going to argue that one too much. Uh, but, you know, it's this misplaced anti-communism. I mean, it, it, the communism was real. It was a threat to a lot of free people around the world and for people who wanted to be free. Uh, but you're right. We did tend to confuse nationalist movements, people who were looking for an anti-colonial uh, uh, ideology founded in communism. And there were some actual American attempts in the 1950s to sort of portray us as the anti-colonial because that's our history. We fought the colonial powers 200 years before anybody else. But uh, in the end, uh, we really failed to identify ourselves as the anti-colonials and uh, we're, we're too friendly with the colonial powers and therefore people looking for an alternative found it in communism. That's in the end what got us into Vietnam. Actually, we became something remarkable in history, which was a former colonized country that became a colonizer. That's something that had never happened before. Uh, yeah. So we moved, through, we moved through the 1960s. We have this terrible tragedy in Vietnam, which I think is just another expression of our failure to understand the power of nationalism because we were so blinded by our anti-communism. Then we get up uh, into the 1970s and another great episode that showed how we were unable to understand the power of this great force came, of course, in our overthrow of the government of Chile in 1973. That's something that I think still burns in the minds of many Latin Americans. And it was something that we did without any real national security imperative here at home. Well, it, it, it also goes back way before communism. I mean, you can trace it back to the Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary and all that stuff. So. But remember the 60s, you know, President Kennedy proclaimed the Alliance for Progress. Uh, we were world leaders in terms of technology. We come into the 70s, we're peacemakers in the Middle East with Man Camp David. Uh, President Carter at the end of the decade in the 70s declares uh, that we're gonna uh, return the Panama Canal, which is trying to get over some of that uh, rancor about uh, our role in Latin America. He's trying to re use that as a way to, to reposition the United States in Latin America. And by the time we get to the end of the 70s, you know, the United States is a peacemaker. We've started to, to get beyond some of these issues of the past. Um, and we're, stay, we're leading the world in technology and moon landings and, and uh, really have something to give to people in terms of economics. Yet when you get to the end of the 1970s, you see uh, Jimmy Carter's, what I consider two enormous failures. One was Iran. He completely mishandled the collapse of the Shah and misunderstood what was happening there. And then, partly due to the influence of his national security advisor, Spignu Brzezinski, he's the one that decided the United States should try to induce the Soviets to invade Afghanistan. And then as soon as they did, start building up the force that drew us into the Afghan quagmire we're still in. So to me, those are two of Jimmy Carter's great legacies. His one certainly was the Panama Canal. I give him credit for that, even though the process began uh, under Gerald Ford. But uh, I also think Carter bears a heavy bear burden of responsibility, not only for the Iran thing, which you can argue was going to happen anyway and would have been difficult to influence from the outside, but particularly for plunging the United States into Afghanistan. And so he left office, handed off that project to Reagan, and that's been handed off to every president since then. Well, let's, let's not go too far into Afghanistan. We'll get there. But the, we were in Afghanistan to get the Soviets out. We got the Soviets out. We left Afghanistan, abandoned it to civil war, and came back after 9-11. So it's not one Afghan project. It was a series of Afghan episodes that the U.S. was involved in. But I want to go back to one place first, uh, and that's the, uh, 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 you know, that, that's the issue of uh, peacemaker in the Middle East, uh, you know, supporting freedom, supporting the Soviet, a anti-Soviet effort, 
All that was based on the idea that the United States had to stand for something in the world, that we had to stand for uh, the rights of people to make their own destinies. And I think, you know, we, we did that very well. And, and in getting the Soviets out of Afghanistan, I think that was a major issue. Let's not forget Iran, that was the hostage taking, you know, we had our hostages in Afghanistan, in Iran at the embassy there for 444 days. And I remember it well, because it was right when I came in the foreign service, my new colleagues were being held captive by the Iranian revolutionaries. So it's not like we could just walk away from that and say, oh, you guys do what you want in the world when you're holding American diplomats hostage. I'm thinking a little bit more about Carter's mishandling of the falling of the Shah and the uh, revolution itself. But let me take you back to the peacemaker in the Middle East thing. If you look at the horror that is happening now between Israel and Palestinians, it has its root ba roots back in the so-called American peace process. That was all a facade. The rights of Palestinians were never considered equally with the rights of people on the other side. So I think that actually the American peacemaking efforts in the Middle East were never seen that way by people there and actually only pre pr promoted a resentment on the part of people in the Middle East for what they saw as a process that was completely biased toward one side, but maintained the facade of being equal to both. So I don't see the contribution of the US to peace in the Middle East as anything better than peace in the Middle East looks today, which is, it's not there. Yeah, but we have, we have peace treaties with Jordan and Egypt, peace treaties between Israel, Jordan, Israel, Egypt. We have uh, relationships that Israel has around the region. We have a recognition of Israel's place in the region. Uh, I think that's all to the credit of the United States. And the fact is that the Arabs weren't insisting on peace with the Palestinians at the time. The Arabs were very happy to make these peace treaties without requiring a settlement of the Palestinian issues because they didn't know how to do that either. Palestinians' uh, population of Jordan was you know, huge and accelerating and destabilizing. Uh, the Egyptians didn't want to worry too much, didn't want to have responsibility anymore for Gaza. Uh, so you ended up with a the nation states making peace, but are these people left stuck uh, on the West Bank in Gaza and still stuck? Um, I grant that we've tried and failed since then to do something, but they were left alone, not only by us, but by their uh, brethren as well. Uh, let me take us up into the 1980s and, and bring it back to the Middle East. I want to talk a little about Reagan. So uh, I was living in, in Nicaragua during the 1980s when Reagan was sponsoring the Contra War and was backing uh, horrific military dictatorships in Guatemala and El Salvador during that period. So I have a very negative memory, having been on the receiving end of Reagan's foreign policy. And I was also covering that region when Reagan had his fantastic invasion of Grenada where we managed to triumph over a country whose entire population could fit inside the Rose Bowl. Um, but I do think that Reagan, uh, in addition to his interest in detente with the Soviet Union, did have one great foreign policy success. And I think it's overlooked because sometimes maybe his defenders are a little embarrassed about it. It came in right around same, at the same time as the uh, Grenada uh, invasion. Uh, you'll remember that that was the time when we were in a crisis in Lebanon. The United States had sent troops to Lebanon in order to be peacemakers. But as always happens, we took one side over the other. That led to the other side being angry at us. And our Marine barracks was blown up with the loss of over 200 lives. That was a horrible moment. And the United States as well. The bloodiest day in the history of the Marine Corps since Iwo Jima. So after that happened, President Reagan said what he had to say which is we're going to chase these terrorists to the end of the earth and we'll never let, never let up until we've gotten them all. But slowly, a few of people around him like Weinberger managed to persuade him, this is just going to get us involved in another civil war. If you plunge into trying to find out who blew up our Marines and try to find them, that's going to take years. That's going to make us a belligerent in a major civil war. Why don't you just say, forget it. We're not going to do it. And that's what Reagan did. He, what we call cut and run. He decided, he said, well, we're just, uh, we're not retreating. We're just uh, redeploying our troops. And in some way he covered it up. He had enough credibility to do this. 
And sometimes you look back at that uh, great Sherlock Holmes story about the silver blaze. It was solved by figuring out the dog that didn't bark. U.S. involvement in the Lebanon Civil War all during the 80s and 90s didn't happen. And I attribute that to Reagan's decision uh, not to pursue uh, uh, the results of that marine bombing, but rather to realize that the good feeling you get from saying you're going to go out and punish those terrorists is outweighed by the trap that they are, those terrorists are trying to lure you into in the Mideast. So I give Reagan credit for that. Well, I'm glad you do. Uh, I think uh, it's also important to remember the United States was active diplomatically about Lebanon at this time as well, that we had, I uh, can't remember exactly when the Taif Accords were, but there was a, a U.S. effort to help the Lebanese restabilize their government uh, and reapportion the seats and things like that. And so we were, we were pretty major diplomatic participants in the Lebanese situation, even if we got out militarily, which was, I agreed with you, the right thing to do. So you come after Reagan. The other thing that Reagan did was he, he brought us to the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, now, granted, he wasn't the only one. He was the one at the end of the process. Uh, but really, um, the, the strength of the United States, the capabilities of the United States, and the failures of the Soviet system ended up bringing down uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and, and their control of the Eastern Europeans. We had this enormous, wonderful flowering of democracy and, and freedom throughout uh, the East, what was formerly known as the East Bloc and the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the fall of the Soviet Union. And I think, you know, U.S. presidents deserve an awful lot of credit for that and the U.S. position in the world. The fact that, again, I get back to the fact that we stood for something and we showed something positive to the world, uh, brought about that liberation. Well, I would counter I'd counter that uh, if you could only let history stop at certain moments, everything would look successful. Yes, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Gorbachev and Reagan were shaking hands. The Berlin Wall fell. Countries in what we call Eastern Europe were able to go their own way. That was all very positive. But look at what happened immediately thereafter. The president, the, our Secretary of State, James Baker, told Mr. Gorbachev, we will not expand NATO one inch eastward toward your border. This was repeated by the Prime Minister of France, the President of France, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the President of the United States. We promised that we would not expand NATO and that those countries you know, that were close to the Soviet Union and through which the Soviet Union and Russia had been invaded time after time would not fall into enemy hands. Well, Gorbachev was about the world's worst negotiator. He got it kind of as a pinky promise, but it was never written down. And then as soon as Bill Clinton wanted to win some votes in the, from the Croats and the Poles and other Eastern European voting blocs in the Midwest, he decided to forget that promise. We pushed NATO right up to the borders of Russia. And I think that's helped create a great deal of the tension we're facing in Europe today. If we had not done that, if we had kept our word and not brought the former Warsaw Pact countries into NATO, Europe would be a much calmer place today. Would you agree? I don't think I would agree, but um, let's go back to the history a little bit. Um, the promise was that we will not permanently station NATO troops in the eastern part of Germany. The promise didn't actually go beyond that because nobody really envisioned that all those countries would become part of NATO. Um, but in the end, the fact is they wanted to join. They wanted to be part of the European Union. They wanted to be part of NATO. They wanted to reform, and their reform was simply to say, well, how do Europeans do this? We want to do it the same way. And so the, the fact that all the Eastern Europeans wanted to join those institutions is what brought us to the borders of the Soviet of Russia in this in this case, uh, and uh, made it, you know, even even former parts of the Soviet Union wanted to join. So it, it it's not that we forced ourselves on somebody, as Secretary Powell said at the time. How do you close down a club when everybody's banging on the door trying to get in? At that moment, we had our foot on Russia's neck. We had placed Yeltsin in power. He was happily dismantling the country and turning it into a, a homeland for a few oligarchs. And we could take advantage of him in any way we wanted. So we were able to do these kinds of things that we had essentially, it seemed like, promised Russia that we would never do. 
what happened was that Russia finally got up. We don't have our foot on Russia's neck anymore, and they're angry. And that's what's causing a lot of this hostility. I think sometimes the United States feels like we can push our advantage without limit, and there won't be any pushback. And I think the situation we're facing with Russia now is an example of how wrong that is. Well, I think the failures were more on Russia's part than the fact that we took advantage of them, shall we say. Their failure to have any kind of coherent foreign policy or uh, influence after the uh, fall of the Soviet Union was uh, a lot of incompetent leadership in Russia, and I would say failure to pursue the kind of reforms that other people pursued that, that put them back on a solid push, footing. But as you go through well, the... Uh, I you say you're absolutely right about the terrible political leadership that Russia had in the 1990s, but that was what we did. We interfered in the Russian election. Yeltsin was never going to win. The communist candidate, Chernobyl Merdin, was definitely going to win that election before we intervened. And we knew that Yeltsin would do our bidding. So it's right to say that, Yel that Russia had terrible political leadership in the 1990s, but it's wrong to say that we had nothing to do with that. I'm going to have to skip over that in the interest of time, and we're going to move on here. Uh, so the United States in the 90s was still the peacemaker. We, we made peace at Dayton between the Yugoslav parties who had gotten into this horrible civil war. Um, we, uh, uh, we were a driver of global prosperity. We were uh, with some, you know, it was the dot-com bubble and the iPhone and all that stuff, but we were bringing new technologies, new creativity, and new uh, uh, capabilities to everybody in the world and, and really sponsoring at that time a global transformation. If you look back at the rise of the global middle class, uh, this was a period of accelerated growth, lower infant mortality, uh, and growing middle classes around the world that's continued through this day from the about 2000 until now. It's been a wonderful period for mankind. People live better lives. And I think the United States, the United States consumer, and the United States policy uh, had a lot to do with that. So let me take you up to 9-11 now. Uh, looking back, I consider 9-11 to have been the most spectacularly successful terrorist attack in modern history. Not because of what happened on that day, but because the terrorists succeeded in drawing the United States into endless conflicts that have wound up costing us huge amounts of money and eroded our own national security while blackening our image around the world. I used to tell my daughter all the time, your life is not shaped by what's ha what happens to you. Your life is shaped by how you respond to what happens to you. So I feel we responded to 9-11 in a terrible way that undermined our own security. How do you feel about the way we responded to 9-11? Was it appropriate? In a way, yes, and in many ways, no. I think um, the initial response, the fact that we had to go to Afghanistan, we had to get the people out of there who had done this to us. We had to get Al-Qaeda out uh, and start pursuing uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, I think all that was fully justified. That's what I would call a, a war of necessity. Um, but as you went, you know, this feeling like, oh, well, we've got to stabilize Afghanistan because if we don't stabilize Afghanistan, we're going to return to the civil war and chaos of Afghanistan in the 1990s. We're going to return to the prospect that terrorist groups will be able to hang out there and plan attacks against the American homeland. And so, uh, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush uh, had uh, a preemption doctrine that basically said we're going to get them before they get us. But the idea that we therefore had to go around the world finding all the bad guys and stopping them before they came to the homeland. And second of all, that we could somehow make Afghanistan stable, that we could bring ourselves there and build institutions and government along the lines of what we had in Washington and that would stabilize Afghanistan. I think those were not fundamentally wrong errors. They were just dumb to think that we could actually do those things. Um, and a uh, problem of hubris more than anything else. Well, exactly. I think that is the problem. America has this idea that we've discovered the secret to good life for everybody. And with our 10,000 mile long screwdriver, we're gonna fix your country. If it weren't for that attitude, we wouldn't have decided we wanted to bring a new kind of 
system to Afghanistan after they've spent centuries developing theirs and then try to replicate that in Iraq and elsewhere. I think it's great to go out and kill terrorists somewhere else before they come and kill you, but that only works if there's a finite number of terrorists. If there's 10,000 terrorists in the world and you can kill 4,000 of them, well, you've just reduced your risk by quite a bit. But if there's 10,000 terrorists in the world and every one you kill produces two more, then you're really not reducing your security risk by going after them. Well, I guess in some ways it's a little bit parallel to the problem we had in the 40s and the 50s that you defined as confusing communism and nationalism, that uh, everybody who takes up arms against the government uh, now the U.S. considers a terrorist. Um, and a government just has to call them a terrorist and they'll have U.S. support, maybe even military assistance or at least advisors uh, in going after them. And I think, you know, yeah, you're right. We have defined the threat much too broadly. But the fundamental idea that we have to help people protect themselves from folks who want to create disorder and just, you know, kill people for no particular reason. Um, I, I think that's still something we have to learn how to deal with. I would deal with it more with diplomacy and helping people build economic bases and better societies, but um, they have to want to do that. And I think we were successful in some places, particularly Eastern Europe, where people wanted to reform their societies, wanted to adopt democracy. We were successful in helping them. So let's take us up to the, the, uh, the Obama era. Um, to me, uh, the uh, w presidency that began with the Nobel Peace Prize ended with uh, a president who dropped 100,000 bombs on seven countries uh, and uh, one who declared Venezuela to be a national security risk to the United States and who ca developed kill lists so that he personally would go over name, lists of names of people who would be killed in drone strikes. I give Obama credit for two very important uh, advances. One was the new relationship with Cuba, and the other was the nuclear accord with Iran. Those were two great examples of uh, positive diplomacy, both of them now having been dismantled. But uh, I think uh, there's quite a reassessment going on of Obama's uh, role in foreign policy. In many ways, it's not positive. Perhaps the worst item on his agenda uh, is Libya. That was uh, at the time Obama took office, the country that had the highest standard of living in all of Africa. Uh, thanks to Obama and other countries uh, going in and destroying the government there, leading to the assassination of the president, the old dictator Gaddafi. That country is now a failed state, a generator of terror all across North Africa and beyond. And now there are uh, Nubian women being sold in slave markets in Libya thanks to the idea of Barack Obama and Samantha Power and Hillary Clinton, that that was a bad regime. And if we dropped a few bombs, it would just become Switzerland the next day. So uh, when Clint, Hillary Clinton was being accused about this, she tried to uh, minimize her own responsibility and said, well, at the end of the day, it was the president's choice. It was the president's call. Uh, Joe Biden, to his credit, was against that intervention. And so was Secre the Secretary of Defense, Gates, but uh, Gates later described it as a 51 to 49 call, which is incredibly poignant when you think of the devastation that the United States has brought to Libya. So to me, uh, the Obama record, very checkered in world affairs. Well, I, I tend to agree with that. I, I would just say that his sins were sins of, uh, uh, I guess, I go back to hubris, I, thinking that we can do these things, thinking that we can make it right, thinking that we have to do something. The, this, uh, the doctrine that you mentioned, Samantha Power, this responsibility to protect, the fact that when something happens in the world, we have a responsibility to fix it, you know, I think can be very dangerous. And it comes from the fact that during the Clinton years, there was a, uh, a genocide in uh, Rwanda that the international community, including the United States, did very little to try to prevent. And therefore, in later years, when we started seeing these kinds of uh, horrible things start happening in different places and horrible oppression, uh, somehow we believed that it was our job to fix it. And uh, again, you know, we stand for the right things, but we, I think, exaggerate our role and it carried away, you might say, in many of these places, and it has led to some awful, awful consequences. I can agree with that. 
Now, to what extent did Donald Trump truly upset American foreign policy? And to what extent was it heading for a fall anyway? Because China was rising, Russia was rising, uh, the authoritarian trend was spreading in many parts of the world. Um, was it Trump who caused a new wave of chaos in the world? Or were those institutions that we created after World War II falling apart anyway? I think the institutions were pretty solid, but the institutions relied on American leadership. You had to have somebody in there who was saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. You know, whether it was the World Trade Organization trying to deal with the issues that China raises as China grows, intellectual property theft, uh, role of state enterprises, uh, the, the falling apart at the WTO, the uh, appeals mechanism, there was nobody there like the United States, the role that we've always played to say, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. We need to make the rules still. We need to be involved in leading the, organ the organizing the people who make the rules. Uh, but we also need to follow the rules. And then you have, I don't, I don't blame Trump so much for, you know, trying to get us out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I do blame him for just kind of pulling the pro plug very abruptly on the Kurds in northern Iraq. But fundamentally, it's not the lack of military, uh, the pulling out of the military role that bothers me. It's the fact that the United States is no longer the organizer, the leading organizer of world affairs. And that means that other people are scrambling to figure out how to deal with China. Uh, look at Australia, look at Europe, uh, dealing with all these issues. And uh, they're left without a leader. I think you're right, but there's a reason for that. The United States lost its moral authority to be the guide. When you say that the United States was the country that finally had to come in and say, this is the way things are going to be done. It makes it seem as though we were a kind of neutral body above all other countries. And we didn't consider ourselves first. Uh, and we didn't wreak havoc around the world. The more we did that, the less we became seen as a reliable, neutral broker. I think we, we lost our credibility over a long period. And when other countries started to rise, uh, we weren't able to get it back. It, I think the days when the United States uh, could dictate to other countries what kinds of governments they should have uh, are coming to an end. It will, of course, continue more in our own part of the world. But the hubris that you referred to, the sense that whenever there's a problem in the world, we have a solution is something that has been guiding us for a long time. And I think it's still guiding not just Trump, but Joe Biden. Uh, I'm still wondering very much whether a Biden presidency would bring us back to the Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama days, or might we be moving into a new era where we don't think we are required to guarantee American primacy over the whole planet forever? Uh, I, I almost feel like just saying, let's hope so. <laughs> you were the one that cited Biden's opposition to some of the military moves that were made in the past. So I don't think we should just say, oh, he's an establishment guy and he's going to just do what we've always done. Uh, I think he is a guy who's learned, he's a guy who spent a lot of time talking to people and learning about uh, the situation overseas. And I think he's he's and read the mood of the country enough to know that the military intervention certainly is not uh, something that people back home are going to support. And I think after the COVID crisis, particularly, uh, there's going to be a, a support for an organizing role for the United States, for U.S. leadership on economics, on public health policy, on climate, uh, but not necessarily a desire on, on behalf of Americans or people in the rest of the world. Uh, to have the Americans intervene to fix their problems. And that's, uh, that seems to me about where Biden is. Biden has a troubling past. Of course, he was a great supporter of the Iraq war and a great promoter of American military interventions with some exceptions. Um, Biden has also said during his campaign, for example, he will not take the U.S. Embassy out of Jerusalem. He will continue U.S. sanctions on Iran. He will continue sanctions on Venezuela. You know, he's very anti-Russia, very anti-China. He's eager to promote uh, Ukraine into a conflict with Russia. 
On the other hand, I, I do agree with something that you said. That's all in the past. That, that's the Biden we know. Things have changed. It's not just the current crisis with the pandemic, but also the effect of Bernie Sanders uh, and changes in the Democratic Party. So Biden is a political person. He's lived in that world his whole life. Things are changing. Uh, it's possible that uh, Biden will emerge from a chrysalis at his advanced age and, and come out somewhat differently. And uh, I think I'm going to uh, stop right here and go home and pray for that. <laughs> I, uh, I think the first thing Biden has to do is get himself elected. Um, people have said a lot of things in campaigns. I remember just about every president screaming and yelling about China. Uh, most of them found a more reasonable kind of uh, arrangement with China as time went on. Uh, I do think that the mood in the United States and the mood among American politicians on China has changed. Uh, but it's, as you say, it's not what happens, it's how you deal with it. And it's not the fact that China is rising and uh, becoming a peer competitor to the United States. It's whether we deal with that by going around the world bad mouthing everything that China does the way Mike Pompeo does, or whether we try to deal with China by setting up a, uh, a system and an organization and a set of rules with other countries that China has to comply with. And I would hope we would see that kind of leadership out of a new American president sooner rather than later. Uh, I agree with you, but I would just, I'd even take it a step further. Uh, it isn't just the problem of trying to deal with the realities of China rather than the political demagoguery around China. I, I see a larger problem, and I think this is going to define the United States in the years ahead. The United States has become accustomed to being the dominant power that decides everything. That's not the way the world is anymore, and it's going to become less and less like that. So at least in a relative sense, American power is declining as China and other countries are rising. So that's not in its objectively a good thing or a bad thing. That's just something that happens. But the question is, how is the United States going to respond to this? Are we ready to accept a world in which we are not the absolute dominant force? Or are we going to strike out violently to try to stop a process that's going to happen anyway? I think our answer to that question is going to go a long way to determining how peaceful or how tur turbulent the coming decade is going to be. True. We don't have the power to dominate. We do have the power to organize. And that kind of leadership from the United States would be most welcome in the world. And we also have the power to end our discussion before it gets too boring. So this has been very interesting. Uh, we could have sharpened it even more. Uh, Ambassador Boucher, thanks so much. And from the Watson Institute at Brown University, at least virtually, thanks for watching and keep your eye on foreign policy during this presidential election campaign and beyond. Thank you.